I was raised in, people would just stop when they felt like it and they would give God praise for the glory that he's doing in their life. And, you know, these songs speak to me so much because I left the church and was voted out back home years ago um, because I knew that I had to follow who God made me to be. And even though I was taught that who I was made to be is naturally of a sinful nature and that I can never enter the kingdom of heaven because of who he made me to be. I had to defy that and find the truth for myself, but I didn't turn to follow him after that. You know, I decided that I was going to do everything else because why not? I'm already going to hell. And so that's what I did. I did everything else, you know, um, everything I wanted to and my heart desired. And it took me years to come back. And it took us a lot of volatile moments that we weren't doing right by each other or by God by far. And through all that, God was faithful to me. Then we came to this church, and we were welcomed so openly. And we were looking for that. You know, I was looking for that, but I know Jamie was as well. And we weren't faithful to all of you. But then Jamie ended up in the hospital. And um, at the same time, my mom and my dad, um, both times he was in the hospital this year. My dad was in the hospital the first time because he had... Uh, he's on blood thinner for years now and he had ripped a hole in his esophagus you know and things didn't look great there but God was faithful and God healed him right up and over and over again things that I pray for God has just been faithful beyond what I could even have imagined and then Jamie ends up in the hospital with something real serious he had severe heat stroke his temperature was 107 he was convulsing and throwing up and they had to literally shoot um, that stuff into his heart to make it start pumping steadily again because it wasn't. And they didn't think he was going to make it. And I called the hospital three times that morning looking for him. <laughs> I've been on all the websites for the jail and stuff looking for him. And I had no idea where he was. And I thought, I'm going to go to work and try to distract myself. And I got a call. And they said, you're the emergency contact from the last time this man was in here. I don't know if you can get a hold of his family or if you're the right person, but we have a Jamie Pickens here um, that came in last night. And um, if you could give us a call back. So I immediately stopped setting up the restaurant and went and called the hospital back. And they said, you know, things don't look good. They said he was found yesterday and we don't know how long he was out there, but somebody called 911. And um, for right now, I can just tell you he's here. I can't tell you he's going to make it. He probably won't. And so I um, called his brother and said, hey, I'm leaving work. I'm going to stop and pick you up. And uh, we're going to go down to the hospital. Your brother's in there. So I get down there. And they say, Paul, he's unresponsive. We have him in a coma so that he won't have any more seizures because if he does he's probably going to die his brain is swelling his body's breaking down piece by piece and really in all actuality his kidneys aren't going to be able to process what his body is breaking down into it with everything else that is going on they said so um, we don't want to get your hopes up but that's where it's at right now so that night they went to bring him some medicine and the doctors woke him up um, by taking off the sedative. And um, they were trying to get him to do some responses, and they said, Jamie, can you raise your right thumb? Well, he raised both of his thumbs. He couldn't raise his right thumb yet. You know, and that was a miracle. That's when I first posted to all of you that he was um, in there, and I was specific about what we needed in prayer. And every time I posted something specifically because it was a long process for 22 days that they didn't think he was going to make it. And all of you were faithful. You helped us out with um, finances. You helped us out with prayer. You stopped in and prayed with us. But more importantly, that was God moving through you to us. And he was faithful even when we weren't. And it's so amazing, you know, I have been falling in love with him, 
you know, even before that happened, a couple weeks earlier, God had been speaking to me. And, um, you know, I had shared one of my favorite Bible verses on there about him being our strength and our refuge. You know, when we don't have the strength, he's our strength to get through this. You know, and that's why we glorify him. He alone is worthy of our praise. Because this man standing here, even after ripping his tubes out of his throat, and they said, well, he's probably going to have vocal damage. So don't expect him to be able to sing again. But he's up here singing with us. He's up here standing. He didn't have to relearn to walk. You know, he can move. He can think. Although sometimes he stutters there. You know, just kidding. <laughs> he can think. So, I just want to pray for that. Amen, 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 amen. We'll give that person on the right and on the left a big squeeze around the neck this morning. Amen. It's good to be here today. Thank you, Paul, for sharing that. Uh, we've not had everybody, just not a lot of people knew what was going on, but um, I'm thankful that he was able to share that today with us this morning. Let me get my message up here. Dun, dun, dun. That is a 10-year-long streak that we're glad that they, they finally. I, I, will, I will tell you, though, you know, 21 up and then yeah. lost it in a matter of just, I was I'm not happy. Sick. I was not happy. But it's okay. Three points, that young, that young guy with a good leg and a good kick, it's all it takes. All it takes, all it takes. So we're glad that you're here today. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Uh, let's just take a moment, you know, let's remind ourselves that the reason why we can't expect God to work for us is because we've shared our finances with him. We've done what we're supposed to do. That's the reason why, you know, it says that there will be meat in my house when you need it. And that is the good thing. So Heavenly Father, right now in Jesus' name, we thank you that you do meet and supply all of our needs. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you are faithful even sometimes when we're not. So, Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you watch over us, you provide for us, you protect us. Father, you do things for us that we don't even see or recognize. So, Heavenly Father, we're here today to say thank you and to bring you glory and honor today. So, Father, as we worship you with our tithes and offerings, we do it now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen, amen. If you're making out a check, make it out to Crossroads. If you're putting cash in the offering, raise your hand and... Brian and our soon-to-be starting over with his Sunday school pen, Keith, Sheep Keith, because he's been gone so long he has to start over again on his Sunday school. That's a joke. Only those of us who've been in Sunday school forever and ever would know that. But uh, it's good. Good to have Jay and Keith back. You were out seeing your mom last week, weren't you, or something like that? Yeah, because yeah. yeah. Robert and Brian got back, and they were here last week, but they said they're going to be gone a couple of weeks, so we're... Missing them, missing a lot of folks. So if you if you see people that are, or you don't see people here that you normally see, and you got their phone numbers, give them a call. Let them know that hey, listen, we miss you at church. I've been hammering on Jasper and them over here for how long? A while. You need to be back in church. You need to be back in church. So he texted me this morning. What time was church? <laughs> They're here. Give them a hand clap. Thank you for coming back. Amen. 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 Well, uh, I got a message for us. Just it, it you know. I believe that if we will just pay attention to God's Word, we will see things that we don't normally see. Uh, you know, this, this guy right here, his name is Edward Browning, uh, Edward Deming, rather, and he's the founder of the Deming School of Management and Wisdom in Washington, D.C. He made a statement. He said, there is no substitute for knowledge. There is no substitute for knowledge. And sometimes when I listen to TV, I, I'm just wondering, where's all the knowledge of those people? And why don't they stand up for what's right? But you know what? When I was teaching school, when I first graduated from university, I, I started teaching school. And one of the classes that I had to take when I was in school was a class on what's called tests and measurements. Anybody ever had to take that test? That class? It was a test school testing center that you had to go through so you could learn how to give a good test. Because we remember the old bell curve. You had so many people up here at the top and so many people there at the bottom. Well, everybody's in the middle. Well, you had to learn how to give that kind of a test. You had to 
you had to figure out how to make that work for you. Well, I got news for you. God gives those tests too. It's really not for him. It's really for us. Really for us to really know what is going on on the inside of us and what do we know and how are we going to use what we do know. And that's the reason why Hosea 4, 6 says, you know, my people are destroyed for what? A lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for a lack of it. Well, the thing is, if you get to a place where you're coming up against a hard place in life, if you do not know what the Word of God says, you're not going to fare well during that testing time. It's not going to do well. It's not going to be well. That's the reason why I try to remind you all the time. He says, you know what? It's, <laughs> it's the truth that you know that will set you free. And if you don't know the truth of what God's Word says, then you come up to that situation where you're your car's breaking down, you got financial issues, you got sickness. What are you going to call on? If I don't know that there's a promise out there for that particular thing, how am I going to get through that? I'll have to depend on doctors and nurses and banks and friends. And I tell you, those all will go away one day. But the only thing that the Bible says will stand forever is His Word. Here's another scripture here in Proverbs 1. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning, the fear, the reverence, the understanding of who He is, is the beginning of knowledge and understanding. I think it's interesting that we talked about this either last week or a couple of weeks ago, how David's mistake of looking over at the wall and seeing Bathsheba and sinning with her, how that cost him that child, but I made a statement that out of that mistake of all of that going on in their lives, they had a second child, and that child's name was Solomon. And from the very beginning, when you go back and read the book of Proverbs, and you read the book of Sol Solomon and Lamentations, you're going to see that all he says was his parents told him to get wisdom, get wisdom, get good understanding. You read the first few chapters. <laughs> All of those books say, our, my parents told me to get wisdom, get good understanding, get knowledge, get knowledge, get knowledge, get knowledge. Well, and then he just simply applied that and put it back into our lives. And that's why he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. There's a guy here, this, this, this guy right here. He's passed away now. His name is Benjamin Bar Barber, political theorist and author who wrote his book, The Strong Democracy. He has a quote here that I, I want us to take a look at here just for a moment. It says, I don't divide the world into the weak and the strong or the successes or failures, those who make it or those who don't. I divide the world into learners and non-learners. There are people who learn, who are open to what happens around them, who listen, and who hear the lessons. When they do something stupid, they don't do it again. And when they do something that works a little bit, they do it even better and harder the next time. The question to ask is not whether you are a success or a failure, but whether you are a learner or a non-learner. How many of you have ever made some mistakes before? How many of you have made the same mistake again? And again? And again, see, sometimes we learn, don't we? And sometimes we don't learn so fast. I've gotten to the place in my life that I don't want to learn a second time. <coughs> I don't want to learn because it was painful enough the first time. Why in the world would you want to do that a second time? Why would you want to put yourself through that one more time? But I know people that do that. They they mess up their finances and they say, oh God, if you'll just get me out of these, if you'll just get me out of this, oh, I'll tithe. So they start tithing. And everything starts coming back. Money starts coming in. Why? Because God is going to honor His Word. And then what happens is they start failing to do what they did to get out of that hole. And then they fall back. And I tell you, sometimes when you, when you 
mess up your finances the second time, it's not really easy to come back around after that. It's like getting sick. You know, if you get sick and you have a relapse, the relapse is always worse than the first time around. It's harder to get over it. I don't want us to be in a place where we make a mistake. We, oh my God, that's, that's a mistake. Let's not do that same one again. That's what he's talking about here. Let's look here in, in James. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You see, God doesn't really get upset when we ask, how do I get out of this? He gets upset, I think, when we ask how to get out of it, and how to get out of it, and how to get out of it. When my kids were growing up, it was interesting that I had, I had one daughter out of four that just didn't always get it the first time. And it wasn't that she wasn't smart, because she's probably the smartest one of all of them. It's just that she didn't want to do it the second time, didn't want to do it the third time. It was that belligerent kind of uh, anti-parent, anti-authority kind of a person, and she just refused to do it. And I'm going like, you know, it's okay. I don't care. I said, you will be the one that suffers from this. You will be the one. I'm not. Here are the rules. Don't follow the rules, and the consequences come. And we think that that's hard. We think that that's hard when you see your children say, you know what, I'm just not going to do it. I think God looks down at us and when we say, I'm just not going to do it. He says, I don't want that for you. I think if I want good things for my kids, how much more does God want good things for us? I'm a firm believer of that. The problem with it is we keep making mistakes. We keep falling backwards and backwards and backwards. He's saying, will you learn? Will you get adrift on that? Proverbs here makes a statement. He says, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and to applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight, there it is, calling out for insight, and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, for the Lord gives wisdom from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. I've made some pretty bad mistakes in my life. I've, I, and I I'm on stage a lot of times, and I tell people, quite frankly, if I just had one more minute in my life, I could go back and change every bad mistake I've ever made in my whole life. Why? Because I've rehearsed them. <laughs> if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't done that. The problem with that is, if I hadn't done that, I probably would have done something else, and the mistakes would have still come on. When my kids were young, you know, there's a lot of different parenting books, and you know, unfortunately, when kids come, they don't come with instruction manuals. <laughs> they really don't. And so that first one, I feel sorry for every firstborn child because they are a mess. Because the parents make so many mistakes on that first one. I did really pretty good with the second, third, and fourth. It was that first one. I'm going like, oh, she's a, it's like a bad batch of cookies. You just end up throwing them out. You don't want to, but you wished you had. But you look at her, and I, and I go, you know what? We might have made some mistakes. But see, God has a way of circumventing our mistakes and getting us out of the deepest of all troubles. And I'm so thankful for that because if I hadn't, then we would have had some serious problems all the way through with all of them. And my question to you is, what kind of test do you face? What kind of scenarios are, are you looking at that you're saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. That test of knowledge is either going to result in good things, or if we're a non-learner, if we haven't learned and we're not willing to cry out to God, then the mistakes might follow and the circumstances might just compound themselves over and over and over again. I'm thankful that my older, oldest daughter 
now has four of her own. And I look at the first one and I'm going, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> My oldest grandson, I can't believe he's a teenager now, and I'm sitting there going like, wow, he's turning out to be okay. Turning out to be okay. We've prayed for him. My former wife and I have prayed for all of our grandkids. Why? Because I want them to have the very best in life. I do. And God wants the very best for you. He doesn't want all of that bad stuff. You know, I, God, I don't believe God teaches us by taking our hand and putting it to a hot stove and say, here, don't ever do that. If I did that with my kids here, I would be in jail. I would be thrown in jail because that's child endangerment, all that stuff. I don't think God teaches us by putting us through bad places in life. I think we learn because we've gone through them, but it's because he got us out. That scripture in Psalms where it says, Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. We're going to go through it. Not because he sent us there, but because we made a wrong turn somewhere. And that's the decision we've got to stop ahead of the next one. Because there's always going to be something else that God tries us for. Take a look here. Come here. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Knowledge is a good thing. Discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. Knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. I like knowing what lane I'm supposed to be in when I drive. But some of the roads have been under so much construction down here, I don't know if you've noticed it, that when they're doing the asphalt, they're not real quick to come back and put the lane markers in. Now, I know that I'm going to stay as far over to this right hand side because I don't know where the lady coming is going to stay over her half or not, or the guy coming is going to stay over his half or not. Those road signs, those markers, those lane dividers are there for us to take a look at and say, you know what, this is really a good thing. I'm, a, I'm, I'm comfortable right here. I'm really comfortable. I think I've told this story before, but there was a psychology uh, psychologist out in California, this has been years ago, and he saw all these kids in this, in this school playground all out climbing on all of the, the fence that's on the, round, on the outside of the playground. The, the fence was really tall so the kids wouldn't accidentally throw the ball over. So these kids were climbing up on all these really tall things, looking over, playing outside, so the psychologist said, you know what we need to do? That's those children wanting to expand their horizons. Let's take all the fences down. So they did. Next year, kids were all huddled in the middle together because they didn't know where their boundaries were, where they didn't know, they didn't have a good understanding of it. I think if we have a good understanding of God's word, when we come to a place in our life that we don't know, we can call on that. I like the fact that God's Word says that we can call to remembrance what He has said. But if you don't know what He said because you haven't spent time reading, you don't know what to remind Him of. I remind God every, every payday, God, you said you'd provide for me. You'd provide. I have to remind God of all kinds of things. Not because He forgets, but I think He wants to know, do I remember? Do I remember? I want to remember what he says. Look here. Abraham in the Old Testament. We remember that he and his wife, Sarah, you know, we talked about his mistake that he, you know, he got into all kinds of trouble because he called Sarah his sister and not his wife. They got thrown out of Egypt. But when he was having that child, when Sarah finally conceived and the little boy begins to grow up, there came that morning that God spoke to Abraham, I want you to take Isaac where I'm going to lead you and I want you to offer him to me as a sacrifice. I don't know what I would do in that circumstance. I don't know. I, you know, 
God says, I, I gave you this child. I want you to offer him up to a sacrifice to me, and I'm going to tell you where to go and to do it. And there that morning that they were supposed to do that, it says that they rose up early in the morning. That's the morning that I've said before that I would want to sleep in, throw the covers over my head, and we're not doing this. But it says that he got up, got the little lad together, tied the wood on the little lad's back, had the fire, and the little boy looks up and says, you know, we've done this before. I've got the wood, you got the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, the Lord will provide. And they get up on that mountain. He lays out all the wood, ties his son up, puts him on the altar, pulls out the blade, and is getting ready to lunge it into his child, the child of the promise. And as he does, an angel stops him and says, look over there into the thicket. He says, there is a ram there for this sacrifice. And what he, does he say? He makes this statement right here. He says, do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I, what? Know that you fear God. Now I know. Because you have not withheld from me, your son, your only son. God had to see, would he believe all the way through? Would you believe all the way through the process? I, I don't know. I'm glad that that was his test and not mine. I don't know that I could give up one of my four, not less, not my only one. But God says, I saw it, I know it, and now I'm going to celebrate that with you. I think that's, a, that's an important thing. See, sometimes, sometimes like when we give, we say, God, if I give, I won't have enough money to pay this bill. I won't have enough money to pay the house payment. I won't have the money to do this. I won't have the money to do this. And God says, give it. But God, sometimes we have to learn to listen because it's not just the giving it's the following through. It's not just the saying to that person on the street, God loves you. You might never have done that before. You might say, well, I don't ever, you know, I, I'm not Pastor Bob and I'm not these other people who are always in front of people. And for me to go over there and do that, I think I, I just can't, I couldn't do that. Couldn't do that. But see, sometimes God asks us to step out of that comfort zone. And the Bible says, if we open our mouth, he will fill it. He will give us the words to say at that moment. But if we don't put our place, ourselves in that position, then how will we ever know? How will God ever trust us with something? We've got to remind ourselves, God's looking for people who are sold out to Him. Sold out to Him. Look here in 1 Peter. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let's hold this back for a second. He says, I, I like this, he says, don't be surprised when this fiery ordeal has come on you to test you. He said, it's going to happen. Things are going to happen. Things, life is going to happen. And how are you going to take care of them when you get to that place? Are you going to trust the banker? Are you going to trust the doctor? Are you going to trust those friends to come to your aid? Are you going to trust that? You know, I want our trust, the very first thing we do is go to God. That's the very first thing. God, have I missed something? Did I not do something? Did I not hear you? If I have, then I ask you to forgive me, but let's, let's, let's move on this situation. Can you move on this for me? That's the very first thing I do. When I see something happening, it's not right. The very first thing I do, I go back and I start to sell. 
what have I done? What have I done? Self-examination is always a good thing. Not to blame everybody else for what's going on, but to take a look at yourself. Why? Because he said, it's going to happen. Things are going to happen. It's going to happen. This story we've read a couple of times before, but it always is a good thing to remind ourselves. The farmer sows the what? The word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word. So what was sown in them? What was sown in them? Others like seed sown on rocky places. Hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they, la they, they lost, that should be lost. It lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this world, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in <coughs> and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, that's us right here, like seed sown in good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. <coughs> Excuse me. But I want to take a look at this scripture right here. But since they have no root in them, they last only a short time. A lot of times when people first get into God and they start building a relationship with them, the very first thing that comes away is the enemy comes in to try to destroy that. And that's the reason why it says that sometimes they last only a short time. People come in, they hear the word, they feel good, they feel, they feel revitalized, they go out and something happens and it just sinks. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they fall away. The devil wants to steal. The thief comes in to kill, steal, and destroy. But aren't we glad that Jesus said, I am come that you might have what? Life and have it what? More abundantly. One last quote here. Uh, you might have listened to Bob Edwards. He was a celebrated host of NPR for many, many years. He says, a little learning is a dangerous thought, but a lot of ignorance is just as bad. It's pretty true. Pretty true. A little learning is a dangerous thought, but a lot of ignorance is just as bad. This week, I know some of you don't own Bibles. Some of you don't own Bibles, and that's, that's all right. What you can do on your app store, there is a place called Bible Gateway, and that's an app, and it has all different versions of the Bible already on it. The one that you'll see me always using is the NIV, New International Version. It is actually a translation from the earliest scriptures we have, the earliest uh, papyrus, the earliest paper versions that we have. It's the best translation that we have for modern English. It doesn't have all the the, the thou, the those in there. And if you don't know, just start reading the book of John. Reading the book of John. If you will do that, the book of John will give you a, the most beautiful presentation and introduction to who Jesus is. So a lot of times people say, well, I don't know where to start. You know, it's such a big book. Where do you start? Start with the book of John. And then if you want a Bible study, there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Since we've talked about Proverbs and Solomon, there's 31 verses 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Just read one chapter a day. If you just read, <laughs> if you just read what Solomon wrote, one chapter a day, I promise you, your life will change. Your life will change because that will give you lots of knowledge, lots of wisdom that has been condensed down all into one small place, one small thing. Just don't be ignorant because you choose not to do the right thing. Just read. Just read. Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you that your word brings light and life into our being. Father, as we allow it, that light to penetrate into us, it shines into us and it shows 
and reveals all the darkness sometimes, the areas in our life that you want to come in and to clean up and to fix up. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you that as we read and study and come more into your word, the more our life will be productive and that entrance of that word will be pleasant to our soul. It'll bring our minds into a place of peace and calm in a, midst, in a world that is filled with so much chaos. We know that the word of God will bring the stability in our lives that only it can bring. So Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and we give you the glory for it this morning now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen and amen. God bless you. We will see you next Sunday. Have a good